Hello and welcome to our digital gathering at Redemption this week. We're excited that you have decided to join us in this way. We're missing getting together with our whole family of believers here. I know my family is missing so many of you guys, and we're looking forward to doing that on June 14th. We're making plans for that, and I'm sure we'll be uh, updating our family as we go along and get ready for that day. So be watching for that. Until then, we gather this way digitally and uh, we worship this way together. If it's your first time uh, worshiping with us or if you're new to Redemption, we want you to go ahead and fill out a connect form. You can do that uh, primarily on the app, Redemption app. You can click on connect and fill out a form there. You can also do it on redemptionin.com and that just helps us know who you are, helps us connect you to our family of believers here. We're going to go ahead and jump in with worship this morning, and then LG is going to take us one step further in this Slaying Giants series. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. That is the word of the Lord and good news. Let's sing together.
your head, Mary said The river's just ahead Down the path of forgiveness Salvation's waiting there You built a mighty fortress Ten thousand burdens high Love is here to lift you up Here to lift you high So if you're lost and wandering Come stumbling in like a prodigal child See the wild start crumbling At the gates of hope You're open wide All who strayed and walked away Unspeakable things you've done Fix your eyes on the mountain Let the past be dead and gone Come on, you saints and sinners You can outrun God Whatever you've done can overcome The power of His blood So if you're lost and wandering Come stumbling in like a prodigal child See the wild start rumbling Let the gates of glory open wide Let the chains fall, 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 let the chains fall. Good child, see the wall start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and wrecked again, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the wall start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory. That'll wake you up. The moth will eat, the rust will break. All the things we hold so dear. And it roars, the ground will shake But in you I have no fear Come what may, come what might The blood you shed is the sacrifice We can hold to nothing but Great love you've shown to us Oh my God, what a wondrous love You would show us grace And oh my God, there are few right words That I sin you would erase
that we built all our plans lay But a mist in the storm One thing remains, one thing endures Mercy raises a new life born It's good to be with you guys this morning, and I just want to welcome you, whether you are watching this at home or maybe you're watching it with some friends today. Uh, maybe you're watching this live online, or maybe you're watching this sometime distant in the future. But regardless of that, we're really glad that you're here and you're tuning in with us. And I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, I've been watching a lot more TV recently than I normally do. Maybe you can relate a little bit to that. Like, I think I've actually finished Netflix. Um, like, I've seen all of it. Now I'm just waiting on Netflix 2 to come out, and I hear good things, so I'm looking forward to that. But normally, my TV watching is made up mostly of watching sports. But see, there hasn't really been any sports recently to tune into, which is really sad. Um, but ESPN came along, and they gave us this wonderful gift called The Last Dance. And if you're anything like me, maybe you've been tuning in and watching this. And um, what it is, The Last Dance is a 10-part documentary that takes a look at the 98 championship run of the Chicago Bulls. And man, I was obsessed with this team when I was growing up because like everyone in my generation, I was obsessed with Michael Jordan. And then watching this documentary and reliving the games, man, it took me right back to my childhood. I felt like a kid again. It was great. And I love seeing all this stuff because for one thing, it put to rest all this nonsense about who was the best. Because MJ, Michael Jordan, was the greatest of all time. He was the best to ever do it. So you guys, you can put to rest all this LeBron James nonsense or any other name you want to pull out of a hat. Michael Jordan was the best to ever lace them up. And also as you watch this, you see not only how great he was on the floor, but man, how huge of a figure he was off the court. I mean, Michael Jordan was as big a star as we've probably ever had. And if you've ever heard the phrase that a rising tide lifts all ships, 
I mean, that was never truer than it was with Michael Jordan. You see, when you think of Michael Jordan, he's so famous, you don't just think of him, you also think of the people that it's around him, the people that were a part of his story. And so a few names probably come to mind when you think of Michael Jordan. Names like Scottie Pippen or Phil Jackson or Dennis Rodman or maybe even Steve Kerr. See, these are the names that are associated and famous just because of Michael Jordan. Now, if you've been with us here the last few weeks at church, you know, we've been in a series called Slaying Giants. We've been taking a look at the life of David. See, a lot like Michael Jordan, David was a larger-than-life figure in the Old Testament. I mean, David lived an amazing life. He was a shepherd boy, and he grew up to become the king. He wrote poetry and music, and he also fought in battles. I mean, he was the iconic warrior poet. See, a lot like Michael Jordan, again, when you think of David, there's probably a couple of names that come to mind. And for most people, whether you've grown up in church or not, those two names that come to mind, the names that you're most familiar with in the life of David, are the names of Goliath and the name of Bathsheba. David's greatest victory and probably David's greatest failure. And see, a couple of weeks ago, we focused in on the story of David and Goliath. But today, we're going to take a look at the story of David and Bathsheba. And man, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, you can go on and flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 11. See, as we dive into this story, there's so many lessons that we could take away from this. Lessons about how to be careful where you let your eyes wander, or lessons about what to do when you face temptation. But I kind of want to look at something just a little bit different here. You see, where we left off last week, David was in a season of waiting to become king. But as we flash forward to this story in 2 Samuel 11, David's in a different season. See, David has been king for a while, and he's in a season of success. In fact, just a few chapters before this, if you look in 2 Samuel chapter 8, the heading over that is David's victories, or maybe in some translations it says David's successes. And see, it actually lists off all of David's victories he's had in the the recent uh, past. You see, he had a victory over the Philistines, and he defeated Moab, and he defeated Hadadezer and his army. David had victory after victory after victory. And then as we get into chapter 10, David faces the Ammonites. And see, this is one of the greatest battles that David would face, probably the biggest enemy he would face since he fought Goliath. They were a large army, and they were wealthy. They had tons of people and tons of money. But see, David takes a little bit different approach with them. He doesn't just go in looking to conquer them or destroy them. He wants to use a little bit of diplomacy. See, he wants to be a good neighbor and invite them in and have a good relationship. And so he sends a group of diplomats to talk to the Ammonites. But as these diplomats get there, it becomes clear the Ammonites don't want peace and they don't want to talk. And they humiliate these men. See, look what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 4. This is in the message version. It says, So Hunan, that's the king of the Ammonites, he seized David's men, he shaved off half of their beards, and he cut off their robes halfway up to their buttocks, and he sent them packing. Now, in any culture, this is pretty clear indication that they do not want peace. You see, when these men get there, they take them, they tie them up, and they shave off half of their beards. Now, in an Israelite culture, I mean, for these men, that would have been completely and utterly humiliating. All right, but as if that wasn't enough, it says after they shave off half of their beards, they cut off their robes right around the waist so that it exposes their butts, their backsides. Now, the Bible's being just a little bit discreet here, all right, which I appreciate, but here's the thing. If you cut off someone's clothes at their waist so that it exposes their backside, well, the truth is that it also exposes all of their other sides. I think you get the picture. And he sent these men to walk back home in this fashion. Now, I don't know what your biggest embarrassment is, what your most humiliating moment was, but I'm guessing that these men probably have you beat by a long shot. All right, they walk home like this, and when David hears what they've done to his men, he's furious. All right, David isn't one to be pushed around. This is King David, the one who's had victory after victory after victory. And so he's going to defend his friends, and this means war. And so David goes to war against the Ammonites. And just like he's done his entire life, he's winning. He's got the Ammonites on the ropes, but then something happens. You see, winter comes in. And this is a little bit weird for us, but here's the thing. Back in this day, when they would go to war, they could fight throughout most of the year. But when winter hit, 
everyone went home. All right? You didn't fight through the winter because, quite frankly, they didn't have the gear for it. All right? They didn't have North Face. They didn't have Patagonia jackets. They didn't have the type of equipment that would allow them to survive the winter. And so everyone would pack up and you would go home until spring came around. And when spring came back around, you would pick up the battle right where you left off. This was just sort of like a Christmas break. And so that's exactly what they did. And that's where we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Look at 11 verse 1. It says, In the spring of the year, in the time when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and they laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So spring comes back around, and this is the time when kings go off to war. But David, the king, doesn't go off to war. It says that David stayed behind. He sends Joab and he sends the army to go on and fight the Ammonites, but David doesn't go. And when it says that David stayed behind, the literal translation of that means to sit. And what David is saying is that, hey boys, I'm going to sit this one out. He doesn't go to war. He's not where he's supposed to be. And the same thing happens to David that so often happens to you and me. He got bored. See, look as we keep reading in verse 2. It says, late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and he was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. So instead of going to battle, David is home, and he's taking it easy. And see, here's the thing. David had spent years going to battle, going to work, grinding it out, leading men, building projects, like doing all of these things. And he gets to this point, he says, you know, what I really need to do is I just need to relax. I need to take a break. And so he's at home. He doesn't go to war, and he's, he's taking midday rest. He's laying around in bed. He's scrolling through Instagram. He's watching Netflix, and soon it's going to be Netflix and chill time. If you don't get that reference, just ask a teenager you know, and they'll explain it to you. But things are about to get interesting. And see, here's the thing. All of this may seem a little bit just normal, right? Like, what's the big deal? This is harmless. He's just taking naps. He's relaxing a little bit. What's the big deal? All right, but here's the thing. When you relax and when you take a little bit of a break and you begin to get bored, boredom is a really dangerous place to be. See, when you get bored, that's the time when you really ought to watch out. See, and maybe that's where some of you are right now. Is that like David, you've gotten a little bit bored. And see, I don't mean just bored because we've been stuck at home for a few weeks, all right? I mean bored because maybe you've been working really hard. That maybe you've been grinding away, you've been working on projects, you've been going places, you've been always on the run, and you're starting to think to yourself, man, I could just use a little bit of a break. Man, I just need to relax. And can I just say, all right, this has been true for me before, maybe it's true for you too, but maybe you're not as tired as you are bored. And I know when I say that, there's some immediate pushback. Inside, you're probably wanting to rebel against that a little bit, all right? But hear me out on this, all right? Because I know what you're wanting to say is that I can't be bored, all right? Just look at my schedule. Look at everything I've got to do. Look at my to-do list. There's no way that I'm bored. In fact, you could probably fill in the blank on this sentence, all right? I'm not bored. I'm what? What would you put in that blank, right? I'm not bored. I'm busy. Right, but here's the thing. Did you know that you can be busy and still be bored? You can be busy and bored at the exact same time. See, I work with students for a number of years, and students are notorious for this. All right, students can have hours and hours of homework to do, practices to go to, games to play in. They can be a part of clubs. They have a part-time job they've got to do, and they're documenting all of this on Instagram throughout the day while sending a thousand texts to their friends. And yet, they can still be bored. Incredibly busy, but still bored. And man, adults are no different. Maybe you've got a to-do list a mile long and you've got to run them to those practices and you've got things at work to do and meetings to get to and, you know, schedules to get done and deadlines to meet and all this stuff going on, and yet you can still be bored with your job. 
So here's the thing. People that are bored with their jobs or bored in their marriages or bored with their routines, they often think that what they need is to be busier. Man, that if I could just be a little bit busier, then I wouldn't be bored anymore. And maybe even right now, we've been on these stay-at-home orders and life's a little bit different. Maybe you think, if I could just get back to being busy, then I wouldn't be bored anymore. Everything would just be better. All right, but here's the thing. Being busy is not a cure for boredom. And here's why. If what you're doing does not align with God's purposes, it eventually gets boring. See, we often think that boredom means you have a lack of stimulus. All right? But that's not what it is. Boredom is not a lack of stimulus. Boredom is having the wrong stimulus. See, what you need is to be a part of something bigger than yourself. See, something that you can contribute to that doesn't numb your soul with busyness, but instead it stirs your soul with holiness. I mean, that's what God created you to do, to be a part of something bigger, something that is eternal. See, if you look in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, it tells us that God has planted eternity in the human heart. And so I just want to ask you this. What are you contributing to that serves an eternal purpose? See, when you're contributing to something that is life-giving, you're not bored. You're not empty because it fulfills that thing inside of you that you were made for. But if all we do is consume, if our lives are only about feeding our own desires, then we get bored. And that's why a lot of people will say that Scripture is boring. Because here's the thing, if I can just be really honest with you, if Scripture seems boring, is it possible that it's boring because you're just consuming Scripture without actually living out the adventure that it tells us to? See, if all we ever do is consume and study the ways of Jesus without ever doing things the way Jesus did them, then yeah, it can be a little bit boring. But when we begin to live this out, man, it's the adventure that you were created for. See, that same thing happens when people say that church is boring. And again, I just want to push on that and say, maybe if church is boring to you, could it be that it's because you're coming to church just to consume instead of coming to contribute to the mission of church? See, when you're contributing to the mission of the church, when you're pouring into other people, when you're serving and volunteering, when you're being life-giving to the people around you, man, church isn't boring. I just want to say, all right, if you're coming to church and you're resting for a little bit, that's okay. And if you need to figure out what you believe about this, that's okay. And if maybe you just need to heal up because you got hurt somewhere along the line, that's okay. There is space here to do that. But if you are a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be on mission with Jesus and you're just coming to church to consume, then man, it's time to get in the game because God created you for more. He created you for something bigger. And if all we ever do is consume instead of contribute, then church is boring and faith is boring. See, that's exactly what David failed to do. He wasn't looking to contribute. He was only looking to consume, looking to fill this desire in his heart for a woman who wasn't his wife. I mean, it gets him in all kinds of trouble. Look as we continue to read in verses 3 through 5. It says, He sent someone, that's David, sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home, and later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Now, many of us are pretty familiar with this part of the story, right? David's home, and he's bored. And when you're bored, you begin to look and linger in places that you probably shouldn't be looking and lingering. And David ends up having an affair with a woman who is not his wife and who is, in fact, someone else's wife. Now, here's the thing. All right, boredom doesn't always just lead to sexual sin. All right? It often does because we're looking for some sort of stimulus to add to our life to cure that boredom. But it can be, there can be other outlets as well. Sometimes it can be a substance abuse issue. That that's the stimulus that you're looking for. Maybe it finds an outlet in the form of anger or jealousy or greed or any number of things. But here's the deal. Boredom always has the gravitational pull towards sin. And now David has to decide what to do about his sin. So we continue reading verses 6 and 8. 
It says, Then David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And so Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. And then he told Uriah, Go on home and relax. See, so David has a choice to make here. He brings Uriah the Hittite home, the husband of Bathsheba, the man who he's betrayed. He brings him home from the war, and David has a choice. He can choose in this moment to be honest. He could confess everything. He could come clean, and that wouldn't be easy, but it would have been the right thing to do. But instead, David believes that confession is going to cost a lot more than concealment. And so David puts this plan into action. He invites Uriah to come over to the palace, and his plan is he's going to get Uriah a little bit tipsy. He's going to give him some drinks. Everyone knows that Uriah is an Israelite pale ale man, and so he pours him a few of those, gets him a little bit drunk, and he decides he's going to send Uriah home to his wife. They'll have a good time, and then everyone will assume that the baby belongs to Uriah. But here's what David didn't account for, is that Uriah had more character than David did. See, Uriah knows that it wouldn't be right for him to go home and spend a night with his wife when all the other Israelite soldiers are off at war. And so he doesn't do it, and what he shows is that Uriah has more character when he's drunk than David does when he's sober. I mean, you have to think that that both aggravated David and made him feel pretty guilty. But now he has another choice to make. How will he cover up his sin? Well, he decides that instead of confessing again, he's going to conceal it. And this time, he has to go even further to cover up the sin in his life. Look what David does next. It says in verses 14 and 15, So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and he gave it to Uriah to deliver. And the letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest and then pull back so that he will be killed. So David again chooses to conceal his sin rather than confess it. And this time going even further than he probably ever thought that he would go. And he not only plans Uriah's death, but he hands Uriah his own death warrant and has him deliver it to Joab, the commander of the army. And Joab follows the king's orders because, of course, they're the king's orders. And so he places Uriah at the front of the battle where things are most dangerous and most fierce. And they pull back from Uriah along with the other men that were with him. And they're all killed. Uriah, the innocent man in this story, is killed because of David's sin. And now here's the thing. We read a story like this and you have to think, like, how in the world did David let it go this far? Like David, this man of God, this man after God's own heart, how could he allow sin to take him to this place? It seems impossible. But here's the thing. We could think, man, that could never happen to me. But the truth is that it could. Sin could so easily take you somewhere you never dreamed you would go. And maybe it's not to the point of murder, but it's very much a place that you never thought that you would end up. A place you never wanted to go. And man, it can happen so, so, so easy. Maybe some of you have already experienced this. See, for David, his whole life up to this point had been success after success after success, victory after victory after victory, until the point that he got complacent. He decided he needed to relax. He needed to take a break. And when you get complacent, you are ripe for failure. See, complacency leads to boredom. See, when things are going really well, when they're at their best, that's when we're often at our most vulnerable. And this happens all the time in the business world. I mean, you just think back to businesses like Polaroid or Kodak, or most recently, Blockbuster. See, in the early 2000s, Blockbuster Video was one of the biggest corporations in America. They were a video rental store that was in every town, sometimes a couple of them. They were all over the United States. And back in the early 2000s, this small little startup called Netflix came to Blockbuster and wanted to partner up on a new business venture. But Blockbuster was big, they were successful, they were rich, and they didn't think that this was worth their time, and so they didn't invest in it. Well, flash forward to today, Netflix is now one of the largest corporations in America, valued at billions of dollars, while Blockbuster no longer exists. See, we can see that stuff in the business world, but here's the thing. That same thing can happen in our personal lives so easily. Then we get successful, when we get comfortable, when we relax and get complacent, man, that's when we're most ripe for failure, most ripe to be destroyed. See, complacency leads to boredom, and boredom leads to sin. 
See, when David got bored, when he began looking for some stimulus to fill this void in his life, that's when he was most susceptible to sin in his life. See, there's a theologian named Soren Kierkegaard that says that boredom is the root of all evil. Remember, David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be at battle, and if he had been where he was supposed to be, engaged in what he was supposed to be engaged in, none of this probably would have ever happened. But instead, he was home, and he had nothing better to do, and so his eyes lingered where they never should have lingered, and David fell into sin. He ended up having an affair with a woman who wasn't his wife. See, the gravitational pull of of boredom is always towards sin, and sin leads to to secrecy. See, when we sin and do something that we shouldn't have done, our first instinct is always to hide it, to do away with it, to sweep it under the rug, to try and make sure that no one ever finds out about it. See, that's exactly what David did. Instead of confessing his sin, David tried to conceal it. But here's the thing, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work for you and me either. And the reason is because we have a memory. See, we know what we've done, we know what our sin was, and we know deep down that God knows what our sin was. And so sin leads to secrecy, and eventually secrecy leads to shame. See, if you've ever smoked a cigar or if you've eaten anything that has a strong aftertaste to it, like onions, you know that it leaves that taste in the back of your mouth, that even after you brush your teeth, even after you scrub everything down, that taste just kind of lingers with you. Well, shame is the bad aftertaste of sin. That long after you've committed the act, that shame just kind of lingers with you. It sticks on you and it makes you feel embarrassed and ashamed of what you've done. So you just want to hide. Hide from anyone that knows. Disassociate relationships. Hope you've never seen somebody again. And it can even start to make you think that you can never be forgiven or loved. Not only by people, but even by God. See, that's the feeling that this gives us. We start out being complacent. We end by being shamed by our sin in a place that we never thought that we would end up. See, we think, how could David have allowed things to get to this point? But the truth is that we can all relate on some level, right? David fell into a sin that led to adultery and led to murder. And maybe you never end up somewhere like that. But maybe, like David, it does lead to a sexual sin. Or maybe it leads to a substance abuse. Or maybe it's just a secret that you've been keeping or a habit that you've been hiding. But we can easily find ourselves following in the footsteps of David. So what do we do? Well, here's the first thing that we need to do. Fight for something that's better than your sin. See, we sin when we don't have anything better to do. So we don't fight sin by not sinning. We fight sin by finding something bigger to dedicate our lives to. We, find, we fight sin by living for something more. See, when David was engaged in the battle, when he was engaged in what God had placed in front of him, this mission that God had called him to, his life was on a completely different trajectory. But without a mission, we are ripe for failure. So I want to ask you, what are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? What is the mission that God has called you to engage in? And maybe it's for you. It's instead of engaging in pornography, you need to fight for your family. Maybe that's your future family. Maybe that's a future wife. Maybe it's a current one. But you need to fight for your family. Fight for your integrity. Maybe for you, you've gotten complacent and some substance has begun to get a grip on your life. And what you need to do is fight for freedom. Maybe for you, it's something different. Maybe for you, you've gotten bored at church, and what you need to do is you need to fight for those around you. You need to fight to invest in the lives of the people that live next door to you or that live in the same house as you, and you need to volunteer or serve or get involved in a ministry. There is some mission that God has called you to. And you know what? Maybe it's volunteering an elementary mission. I promise you won't be bored when you work with them. But we need to fight for something because here's the thing. If you don't know what it is that you're fighting for, then you're probably really close to getting bored. And that's a really dangerous place to be. And see, here's the other thing, is that maybe you've already been bored for a while. And maybe you've already followed the footsteps of David. And maybe sin has already taken you somewhere that you never dreamed that you would go. And you think, man, how in the world do I get back? Can I ever get back from here? Well, as we look at the story of David, all right, his sin carried a lot of consequences. His sin caused a lot of damage and a lot of hurts and things that would linger for the rest of his life. All right, but here's the thing. David did eventually come back to God. And he eventually re-engaged in the mission that God had put in front of him. David went on to do some amazing things for the kingdom of God. 
And see, what, what finally woke David up was realizing and having to face the cost of his sin and the cost of his actions. See, when David realized what his sin had done, the hurt that it has caused, and ultimately that it caused the death of an innocent man, that's what woke David up. He killed a man that was innocent in Uriah. See, Uriah was the one who hadn't done anything wrong. Uriah was the one who was just loyal to his king. Uriah was the one that went off to fight a battle that wasn't really even his own. And Uriah was the one that had to die as a consequence, not for his own sin, but for the sins of David. And see, that very same realization is what wakes us up from our sin. It's that an innocent man had to die because of your sin and my sin. See, just like Uriah, Jesus died in our place. He was innocent, but even more so than Uriah because he never sinned in his entire life. And he went to fight a battle that wasn't his own. He fought the battle of sin and death, our battle. He engaged in that and he defeated them on our behalf when he didn't have to. See, the big glaring difference between, between Uriah and Jesus is that when Uriah died, he didn't do so willingly and he didn't do so while knowing what David had done to him. But Jesus went to the cross and he died for you willingly. And he died for you knowing fully what you had done to him. He chose to die for you in spite of all of that. That's the love that our God has for us. See, when we realize that truth, when we realize who Jesus is and what he's done for us, that's the truth. That's the realization that wakes us up from our sin and it brings us back to God. When we realize that, we stop concealing, we begin confessing. We begin living for something bigger than ourselves. We live to point people to a God that would crucify himself for us, a God that would die for us. See, that's something worth bigger that we can live for. That's so much bigger than our sin. See, when David realized this, he went on to write a prayer in Psalms 51. And it's something that I've read um, over and over again throughout my life when I've faced sin in my own life, when I feel overwhelmed, when I've walked down a path where I'm left filled with that shame that we talked about that just kind of sticks to you and lingers to you. That's what David wrote in Psalms 51 to address that. And so I read this, and I've had to read it a lot in my life when I failed. And today, I want to close up our message by reading this prayer for us. So I'm going to read this, and what I want to ask you to do is just close your eyes and bow as we pray this together. Psalms 51, verse 1 through 7. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proven right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even from there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go into a time of communion now. Uh, just to take part in what Jesus instituted the night before he was crucified. That he took his uh, little group of believers together, his disciples. And he shared bread and wine with them. And he said, this is my body, which bro is broken for you. This is my blood, which is spilled out for you. And we're going to take part in that meal this morning. So if you would, just go ahead, grab uh, whatever is is convenient to you there in your home. And we're just going to take a moment to remember that Jesus gave his life, the ultimate sacrifice, so that we could live, so that we could have life with him forever. Lasting on. 
Surrender to your desire. 